shortly after Abdu'l-Baha arrived in New York City, a moving picture concern requested him to pose before their camera. He replied at once, Kheli Khub, very good. Now, some of the Baha'i friends who were present were very much upset by his decision and hastened to inform him that his photograph would be scattered all over the country in moving picture houses and theaters. He replied, Besyar Khub, most good. The result was that he appeared before the camera at the entrance of the Hotel in Sonia for a very short film. It was a wonderfully impressive sight. For Abdu'l-Baha, as he approached the camera, was exhorting Baha'u'llah to bless this means for the spreading of the heavenly cause throughout the world. Early in June, we conceived the idea of an extended motion picture in which Abdu'l-Baha would appear in various scenes. He consented at once. The picture was taken at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Howard McNutt, 935 Eastern Parkway, Brooklyn, New York. The first scene was somewhat curtailed by the fact that Abdu'l-Baha did not remain in focus, but he hurried into the house. Somewhat in the fourth scene, where he appears alone, we had hoped he would stand longer before the camera, Uh, But his utterances came forth with wonderful intensity and power. All of these were never to be forgotten scenes, but those who beheld his countenance in the final utterance of the glad tidings will treasure the memory of it forever. Abdu'l-Baha's object in the motion picture is that it shall become an instrument for spreading the message of the Baha'i revelation throughout the world. From the film, They intend to make a number of copies and send them into the East, Egypt, Persia, India, and other countries. The influence that this will exert is beyond any power of estimation. Furthermore, it is our intention, Abdu'l-Baha's consent already having been willingly given, to take a recording of his voice on the Edison talking machine. I am the Edison phonograph, created by the great wizard of the new world, to delight those who would have melody or be amused. This record will be heard in conjunction with the moving picture film and slides. Human power of invention can go no further in reproducing Abdu'l-Baha for the benefit of the coming generations. The greatest effect will be apparent in those coming years long after the blessed subject himself has passed from this earthly world. Consider what this means. The beloved friends 100 years from now will be able to see the form, face, and actions of the beloved center of the covenant, and even more, listen to the actual tone of his voice, speaking the words which the pictures so eloquently portray. It is our hope and expectation that the exhibit of the moving picture of Abdu'l-Baha, along with its accessories, will become a most powerful instrument for the spreading of the most great message of peace and unity. May all heavenly blessings follow this earnest effort. You're listening to The Journey West Podcast dedicated to following the travels of Abdu'l-Baha in the West. Today's feature is one of my favorites. It's so fascinating to view history through the lens of film and media. Without it, how could we appreciate Abdu'l-Baha's movements and expressions? For the first time ever, we can potentially experience for ourselves his voice and look into the features of his face, like so many of the early believers. Just as the excerpt from Star of the West suggests, generations will benefit from these moving images. It's especially funny because here we are, a hundred years later, doing just that. Yeah, you're so right. So by this point in the journey, the summer heat was becoming hot and humid. After two months of constant service and traveling, the master was often tired. He stayed for a period in Montclair, New Jersey, to rest, and would later visit Agnes Parsons' summer home in Dublin, New Hampshire. With over five months left, 
There are still so many more talks, people, and places to enjoy on our journey. In the preceding months, Abdul Baha will go to Canada, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Nebraska, Colorado, Utah, and California. We look forward to continuing these travels with you. But for now, let's listen to a talk read by Anna about distinction. 15 June, 1912. Talk at 309 West 78th Street, New York. I have made you wait a while, but as I was tired, I slept. While I was sleeping, I was conversing with you as though speaking at the top of my voice. Then through the effect of my own voice, I awoke. As I awoke, one word was upon my lips, the word empty yaz, distinction. So I will speak to you upon that subject this morning. When we look upon the world of existence, we realize that all material things have a common bond, and yet, on the other hand, there are certain points of distinction between them. For instance, all earthly objects have common bodily ties. The minerals, vegetables, and animals have elemental bodies in common with each other. Likewise, they have a place in the order of creation. This is the common tie or point of contact between them. All of them pass through the process of composition and decomposition. This is a natural law to which all are subject. This law is ruling throughout creation and constitutes a bond of connection among created things. But at the same time, there are certain distinguishing features between these objects. For instance, between the mineral and vegetable, the vegetable and animal, the animal and human, points of distinction exist which are unmistakable and significant. Likewise, there are distinctions between kinds and species of each kingdom. When we consider the mineral kingdom in detail, we observe not only points of similarity between objects, but points of distinction as well. Some are immovable bodies, some hard and solid, some have the power of expansion and contraction, some are liquid, some gaseous, some have weight, others, like fire and electricity, have not. So there are many points of distinction among these kinds of elements. In the vegetable kingdom, we also observe distinction between the various sorts and species of organisms. Each has its own form, color, and fragrance. In the animal kingdom, the same law rules as many distinctions in form, color, and function are noticeable. It is the same in the human kingdom. From the standpoint of color, there are white, black, yellow, and red people. From the standpoint of physiognomy, there is a wide difference in distinction among races. The Asian, African, and American have different physiognomies. The men of the North and men of the South are very different in type and features. From an economic standpoint in the law of living, there is a great deal of difference. Some are poor, others wealthy, some are wise, others ignorant. Some are patient and serene, some impatient and excitable. Some are prone to justice, others practice injustice and oppression. Some are meek, others arrogant. In brief, there are many standpoints of distinction among humankind. I desire distinction for you. The Baha'is must be distinguished from others of humanity. But this distinction must not depend upon wealth, that they should become more affluent than other people. I do not desire for you financial distinction. It is not an ordinary distinction I desire, not scientific, commercial, industrial distinction. For you, I desire spiritual distinction. That is, you must become eminent and distinguished in morals. In the love of God, you must become distinguished from all else. You must become distinguished for loving humanity, for unity and accord, for love and justice. In brief, you must become distinguished in all the virtues of the human world, for faithfulness and sincerity, 
for justice and fidelity, for firmness and steadfastness, for philanthropic deeds and service to the human world, for love towards every human being, for unity and accord with all people, for removing prejudices and promoting international peace. Finally, you must become distinguished for heavenly illumination and for acquiring the bestowals of God. I desire this distinction for you. This must be the point of distinction among you. Now to our roundtable discussion. Hi, I'm Aisu Vahid. Uh, I studied social work and social administration. I'm Tara, and I'm a writer and multimedia artist. Hi, I'm Jean, and I'm a painter. One thing that I thought was interesting is when Abdul Baha says that he wants a spiritual distinction for us, not the usual distinctions that we make in society. So it, it, he wants us to become transformed and to become beautiful, but in a spiritual way, not a physical way. And we usually think of becoming distinguished as, as being more professional or more successful in life or more beautiful, wearing the right clothes or makeup. But he's really talking about transforming our character and transforming our soul, ultimately. And it really, I think, requires us to see each other with new eyes, in a way, to appreciate different aspects of each other, to look for these virtues and how we exhibit these virtues and admiring new, uh, new qualities in people. And actually, when you see those qualities, that really is the true beauty. It's not a physical beauty. It's really how that how those characteristics and those qualities animate or bring life to someone's face, for instance. It's like, almost like when you're talking to someone on the phone, you can't see their face, but you can hear them smile. And I, I think so the same thing, because uh, uh, when, I, when I read the talk to it, it made me uh, uh, like uh, transform myself instead of, uh, of uh, trying to that I'm transforming the society, but before transforming myself. So it made me to uh, see myself that I have to change myself first before I, I change uh, friends around me so, uh, by following uh, uh, the love that he talks about. And, and that's really so amazing to myself. And one of the things that he talks about um is really distinguishing ourselves by virtues. And for Baha'is, our purpose, we see our purpose in life is knowing and loving God and carrying forward an ever-advancing civilization. And really the fundamental way that we advance is how we relate to each other. So if we really focus, as you mentioned, Vahid, on trying to transform our character Eventually, we will transform society and we won't have wars anymore. We won't have to lock our doors because we're afraid of theft. It, it affects us in every aspect of our lives once, as you pointed out, you start transforming yourself. Another thing that makes me think of is, you know, if we look um, today to the ways in which society tells us to transform ourselves, they are not necessarily what Abdu'l Baha is referring to. So it's important to always know what, in reality, what true transformation is. And that is focusing on these inner virtues. Yes, not in terms of uh, wealth, but a, a Baha'i distinction. The one which is about loving humanity and trying to make sure your friend is also happy. This kind of distinction is also accessible to anybody. You know, you don't have to have a certain degree of education, a certain amount of money, the right friends. Anybody can strive for this. And it's also very important, I think, when uh, people have children, really thinking about how they can encourage the development of virtues and one of the things that the Baha'i Writings talks about is the importance of educating women 
because women become the mothers of the next generation and can help the children really learn to develop their character from a very young age by praying and reading the writings, memorizing things, but also by service because it's through our actions that our deeds become known, that, our, that we can manifest those virtues in our lives. And when children learn that from a very young age, it becomes part of their character. So that in the future they become uh, better citizens. Um, exactly. People who are building a new world order. Reading what this transformation involves, it's beautiful, but at the same time it just seems like it requires so much concerted effort. Um, Really, the, Abdul Baha says that you must be di- distinguished. You must become distinguished in all the virtues of the human world, and that seems like it's uh, an effort. That every moment of every day, you have to be conscious of this in your um, interactions with your family, your children, as you were saying, with your coworkers, how you treat yourself. It's a, a constant striving. So it's a it's quite a challenge. When I when I got into my job, uh, in the beginning, it wasn't, uh, I didn't go there because they were p- uh, going to pay me a lot of money. Uh, but uh, I was trying to, to test how my work was. And then when I entered into the job, there was, it was so challenging that I was dealing with the HIV AIDS patients. I was dealing with the uh, youth of, uh, with drug abuse. And uh, it was almost making me like I have to quit the job because it was so challenging. Then I had another Baha'i who was working uh, in the same uh, 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 guidance and counseling department. He, he, he was the one who gave me more encouragement that, ah, don't worry, you're Baha'i, you, 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 we are Baha'is, we have been born to serve people. So in the long run, you, uh, you manage it. And for sure, uh, through the writings and everything, I, I managed it. I became firm and late. I got used to the job, and I started liking the people, and I was always welcoming, and I needed to help them more and more. That kind of love that uh, and distinction that Abdul Baha talks about in uh, is is kind of re- a Baha'i culture that is really tran- can transform someone, and we become better workers. And, We don't even mind about money, but we are there to help others. I'm very much interested in the arts world, particularly film um, and that type of thing. And I I find myself often asking myself the questions of, uh, is this is this piece that I'm working on? Is it does it embody the morals that I would like to convey? And often it would be. It's a relatively benign piece. It would be fine if I put it out there. But I know that it's only, it's not really uh, distinguished from the rest of what's out there. It's kind of this relative distinction. If, if you, based on what is available in society, this seems to be um, harmless. But what, what I know I, I want for my work and what I want as a reflection of my character out there is something that strives to to show um, these qualities. So I, I think it's just like the, the question comes up a lot in creative choices and the arts. I really like your comments because I think that in the arts, the arts can awaken these kinds of sensibilities in people, but they can also awaken other sensibilities like Abdu'l-Bahá talks about. Um, the animal kingdom and the the animals have instincts and they they behave on instinct. They don't have the choice of free will that we have to be able to choose to be kind or or mm-hmm. choose to be loving or whatever qualities you're you're striving for. And I think the arts can can help inspire people to become better people and to transform themselves. And especially when the creator, in this case you as the artist, is has these noble aims of trying to trying to make your art embody 
those essences rather than than just being kind of a little different than someone else's. So it's really a change on an order of magnitude when you think about trying to help people understand these qualities through your art instead of what happens very often, which is people want to be distinguished from the other artists so that they'll become famous or make more money. It's a different a different attitude and a different goal. Yeah, measuring what constitutes success then will change as well. And in all the professions, I think people face these same issues as you were talking about in social work and mm-hmm. and in the arts. In all professions, really, you come up against questions of ethics and questions of behavior. Sometimes the... the uh, profession that you're in might not only accept but condone behavior that that's really not acceptable to the employee. And and it's difficult then to try and focus on how do I affect change in this environment and in, in the workplace and in my profession. And and I think of that in terms of coming back to this idea that we speak of frequently of elevating the conversation and trying to always turn our vision and our conversation towards those kinds of higher ideals that we're striving to achieve and trying to incorporate into our actions. That's it for the podcast this week. If you'd like more information about Abdul Baha's travels in the West, Visit our site, www.thejourneywest.org. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at The Journey West. Thanks, everyone. Bye.